Um, okay, so let's talk about technological unemployment, and I'll I'll, I'll use the same uh, gimmick from my perspective here, which is to to catch you up in your own language here. So, this is from chapter three. It says why you should hate your job, and and here's the sentence: You probably have a job. You may like that job, possibly even love it. It may be the essence of who you are, the thing that gets you out of bed in the morning and gives you a sense of purpose in life. My goal in this chapter is to convince you that you are wrong to feel this way. Even if your job seems good to you right now, you should resent living in a world that requires you to work for a living. To put it bluntly, I will be arguing that work is bad and getting worse, and we should welcome its technological elimination. So John, you and I are friends, we've talked about our jobs and we, we rather like what we do. I mean, I love that I, I get to wake up in the morning and read and write, and we're very privileged in a certain sense. You know, There's lots of jobs that I probably wouldn't like and I feel very lucky not to have to work them. But your claim seems to go beyond that, that there's something about doing things that might even seem like part of your identity or might seem to have value to you, but that insofar as you're, as it were, required to do it in exchange for money, there's something about that structure that we should object to. So what's wh why should we hate our jobs, to just um, put it as bluntly as you have in your book? Yeah, I mean, since you're reading my own words back at me, I feel like I need to you know, open up my own book and <laughs> read. Again, the paragraph just after the one you, you, uh, yeah, yeah. you quoted right. starts with, let me start with confession. I'm one of those people who loves their job. It is the core of who I am. So in arguing that work is bad, I am arguing against my own day-to-day -day experience of work. So this makes the argument I'm about to defend a tough sell even to myself. Okay, and then I go on to say, it's important to understand the structure and scope of the argument. So like, what, like, what exactly am I arguing when I say that work is a bad thing? Well, like part of this de depends on what you define as work, okay? And you know, philosophers love definitional questions, or at least, I guess, historically in the middle part of the 20th century, they were famous for loving definitional questions, maybe a little bit less so nowadays. Uh, but maybe very quickly, like one of the things I, I argue in the book is that work should not be defined as any kind of particular task or type of activity that humans engage in. Rather, work should be defined as a condition under which activities get performed, namely the condition of kind of like economic reward or economic necessity. So you work in order to achieve an economic reward, a monetary reward typically, or some kind of commodifiable reward that you can exchange on a market or something like that. And in, for many people, this is necessary in order for them to gain access to or unlock other goods in life. If they don't have the income that they get from the job, they won't have access to these other things that they find desirable. And so that's what I object to is the need to perform activities under that set of conditions. And so when I'm arguing that work is a bad thing, I'm arguing that we should remove that conditionality from our activities so so, so yeah. to, to to float back to andrew yang then do you do you support something like a, a universal basic income or we should we should live in a, a polity where our basic needs are met automatically and then it then then the question becomes what now do we do with ourselves given that we don't we aren't required to perform these activities in exchange for income in in order to be able to meet our basic needs yeah i mean i i, I think that the prospect of technological unemployment raises two great problems for society. One is what I call the uh, distributional problem, which is the effect that it has on income. And given the fact that we, we, we live in cultures or societies in which an income is necessary in order to gain access to the things that make life worthwhile to a large extent. I, like, I'm not saying it's necessary for every single thing that makes life worthwhile. And it varies, obviously, by country. Maybe a lot worse in, in some countries if you don't have a job than it is maybe in you know, the country that I live in, for example, although it's not necessarily great either. But um, we'll need to address that distributional problem if there's widespread technological unemployment. And there are various suggestions as to how you do that. You know, basic income is one suggestion. I suspect a combination of proposals is, is probably needed here rather than any kind of single silver bullet that will solve everything. Um, again, provision of basic services and needs to people would also be useful, uh, in a perhaps as a complement or in addition to basic income. But yeah, like once we remove that sense of need, that kind of desperation or necessity of having a job in order to unlock these other goods that are basic needs and services, uh, what then do we do with our lives and what can make our lives worthwhile? That's kind of the larger question that's explored in the book. And that's the second challenge of technological employment, which is it's kind of meaning challenge. 